By the mid-80s, the pioneering extreme metal bands like Venom and Celtic Frost were becoming internationally recognized. But in the meantime, there was a new extreme music style developing in English cities like Birmingham, a place well known for its metal pedigree. But this sound was a far cry from Black Sabbath and Judas Priest. Welcome back to Lockhorns, Banger TV's live weekly metal debate show straight from the Banger Bar. A reminder, if you're watching this in the archive, we do go live every Thursday at 4 p.m. Eastern. If you haven't subscribed already, please do. Okay, well, we're picking up on a relatively new tradition this week in uh, the Banger Bar, and that is the essential albums of specific metal subgenres. And as you guessed by the intro, this week we are doing Grindcore, and we're done. <laughs> Kidding, not a technical error, a rare thing on Banger TV. Just a little Grindcore joke for y'all. This might have been the shortest show in history. In any case, we are doing the 10 essential grindcore albums and to help me with this i've got a guy joining me this week who is the director behind an upcoming documentary on grindcore called slave to the grind check this out Yes, this is going to be a good one. Love myself some grindcore. Here we are with Mr. Doug Brown. Nice to meet you. Good day. Thanks. Thank you for joining me. This is great. This will be a lot of fun today for sure. Yeah, Thanks for definitely me. will. Doug is the man behind that documentaries and others, and uh, this is going to be a fun one. Tell me a little bit about how you got into grindcore. How'd that dark journey start? <laughs> um, well, uh, I think like a lot of people who like heavy metal, started with thrash metal. Yeah. Um, you know, I was eight years old, my cousin Danny made me this mixtape with Slayer, Megadeth, Anthrax, Metallica, of course, and uh, from that point onward, I got more and more into extreme, faster, went into death metal, obituary, which is obviously a very slow death metal band. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it was probably with, um, I listened to Stone Mouth Secrets by Soylent Green. That was mm -hmm. a kind of a, a pivotal album for me. Yeah. Um, when I first heard that, it was had slow parts, but it had a lot of blast beats. And and I loved the, the shrill vocals, and then I was I had to find out what is this thing called grindcore, and right. what uh, what could be more extreme than that. So from there, you know, obviously Fantastic. Napalm Death. And, yeah. Well, yeah. warning everyone: if you call, consider yourself a bit of a grindcore expert, go toe to toe with this guy because as you can see, he's brought a lot of his wares. In fact, he brought his vintage vinyl box over here with uh, tons of uh, grindcore vinyl to share. But tell me a bit more about the documentary. What, what, what's happening with the doc? Um, well, the purpose of it is it's an educational film, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a history of, of grindcore, how and what, why it started. Um, it uh, kind of starts in two different places. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it starts in Flint, Michigan and Birmingham, England, uh, which a lot of people consider to be the two birthplaces of grindcore. Mm -hmm. um, it travels all around the world, goes into Japanese grindcore goes a bit into noise core and uh, gore grind and porno grind and all the different subgenres. Um, but it's essentially it's going to answer the what and the why and, cool. the, and the why it still persists. Well obviously yeah. in the extreme metal episode we did for Metal Evolution we only did like that much. We yeah. kind of just covered the essentials mm -hmm. to get the ball rolling so it's great that you're digging into it uh, more deeply because with that episode it was kind of frustrating I think for us because there was always so much more to say about black metal and death metal and grindcore. And I find that with these uh, kind of micro subgenres, you have people that are so emotionally invested sure. in the material. Yeah. Um, that, you know, there's a sense of identity with yeah. a, a lot of people who likes these types of music. So yeah. you'll always miss something, exactly. right? So you just do your best and cover as, as much as you can. Yeah. But uh, like we're doing today, the, to me, what's what's most important is what is essential. Absolutely. What what are the things that have uh, kind of changed the genre um, and influenced uh, some of the more modern and current bands? Great. Well, speaking of emotional investment, we've got a lot of people uh, joining us us today and so I want to give a shout out to everyone around the world uh, joining us for the Grindcore Lockhorns today. We've got people from 
California, Illinois, Pennsylvania, Maryland, Florida, Missouri, Connecticut, Tennessee, Texas, right here in Toronto, where we are, of course, and then uh, globally, uh, UK, Denmark, Finland, Austria, Belgium, uh, Portugal, Greece, Italy, Poland, Brazil, Peru, Argentina, Taiwan, Turkey, uh, South Africa, and the tiny village of Longfield. I have no idea where that is, but yeah. it sounds like somewhere very quaint in England, <laughs> in any case. Uh, this week, of course, we're tackling essential albums. So a reminder to everyone, this isn't just about the bands. This is not about the genres. We actually want to boil it down one level deeper and get to what are the 10 most essential albums of Grindcore. And hopefully by the end of this messy exercise, uh, we will have 10 up here on the board that we can all reasonably agree uh, with. Uh, and speaking of... No, speaking of not agreeing, because we often disagree, Lisa Latasur is here, as always, equipped with the cowbell from hell. I don't disagree. <laughs> I just try and keep things on track. It's good. It's all right. We can disagree. This is about lock horns. Anyway, um, let's get started. Um, we should take a look at the grindcore band chart uh, that we created on the heavy metal family tree. And I don't, Lisa, do we have a graphic of it? There, there it is. is. Okay. What a uh, mess. <laughs> this is, was, you know, we did a grindcore episode. We had some magnets already made, of course, Repulsion, Carcass, Extreme Noise, Terror, Napalm, Death is there, Rotten Sound, Brutal mm -hmm. Truth, uh, Nozum, uh, Cephalic Carnage, Pig Destroyer. And then we added some bands, Anal Cunt, Berserker, I think, is that up at the top? Mm -hmm. No, Terrorizer, of course. What am mm -hmm. I thinking? Not Berserker from Australia. <laughs> Terrorizer, Cattle Decapitation, Discordance Axis, um, Fuck the Facts, Bruheria, Gore Grind, uh, Bolt Thrower, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think about that list? Uh I think it's pretty good, yeah. you know. It, what I like about that list is it covers a wide spectrum of grind, yeah. including a band like Cattle Decapitation, you have the Death Grind angle. Yeah. You know, I'd also argue the early Misery Index albums could be uh, uh, lumped in there. You have Anal Cunt covering the noise spectrum. Yeah. Um, you know, Bolt Thrower is a band that's arguable, right? Yeah. You know, like at that same time. Well, they were kind of off in the question mark. Yeah, is that, uh, is that more death metal? Created. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. For sure. So definitely a lot of debate. But yeah. in your opinion, so what makes a good grindcore record in your opinion? I think it has to have a few different things. Firstly, it, it has to be punk. Mm -hmm. I, I think that uh, grindcore has like a punk uh, ethos to it. Sometimes that translates into short songs. Yeah. Um, and so I, I think that uh, some of the DIY ethic of a lot of these early grind albums, you look at the first uh, few Napalm albums, you look at Repulsion's Horrify, they, yeah. they definitely have this like punk attitude to it. Mm -hmm. um, secondly, it has to have blast beats. Um, you know, yep. almost every single drum on every single hit, or there's obviously different variations on it, but that pushes the speed to a, a new level. So yep. blast beats and speed kind of go hand in hand. Um, and, and I would also say like a grisly bass tone. Yeah. You know, if yeah. you think about a lot of these uh, early grind albums in particular, and, and what a lot of bands even, like if you think about uh, modern bands in the Midwest United States right now, they're, they're these like, these nasty grisly sounding bands. Yeah. Um, so I think the second you hit this like barrier of being like too pretty, and pristine, yep. it's no longer grind. I think you make a good point. Obviously, when we did the extreme metal episode, we dug into death metal, uh, black metal, and 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 grindcore. And there's a certain, for lack of a better phrase, kind of messiness and mm. dirtiness in in a lot of grindcore production. I think your comment about the bass is very important because often it's actually quite a lot louder in the mix, which kind of just makes everything a little more dirtier. At least that's what my ears hear. Yeah, and and a bit of history here. That was yeah. an accident. So Scott Carlson um, meant to redo the, the bass track in um, the Repulsion Horrified album. Um, so that's actually a blown out scratch track that they ended up using okay. in it. And then that ended up being, to me, kind of the archetype of the sound and bands like, right. like Dan Lilker from Brutal Truth ended up yeah. trying to copy that. Right. And Shane Embry heard that and thought right. it was just magnificent. So why not copy it as well? And it's a good so. point too. I mean, maybe I'm on a tangent here because I'm a bass player and I care is that quite often in these uh, grindcore bands, the bass players are actually quite prominent uh, figures in, in the band. Yeah, for like sure. Bill Steer, of course, and, and Shane Embry being another. Anyway, enough bass digressions. We need a bass digression, bass rabbit hole <laughs> graphic, or <laughs> yeah, that'll do. Anyway, uh, <laughs> let's get things started uh, with, with the discussion. Uh, what we always like to do uh, to kick things off with our guest is our guest uh, tells us what they think the legend uh, album, in this case, is of, of the genre that we've uh, picked today. Uh, 
Tell us that album. Okay, so I'm gonna go with um, Repulsion's Horrified. Right. Okay. Um, this to me is, uh, you know, an album that is a demo recording, right? right. So this album was actually released, um, I think, on Necrosis Record, which is a subsidiary of Earache in 1989. Right. Though it was recorded as a, a demo called Slaughter the Innocents in uh, 1986. Mm -hmm. um, early incarnations of this album were flying around as they were another band called Genocide. Right. Um, if you listen to some of the tracks on this, um, in particular, there's a Napalm Death song called uh, Deceiver, which is uh, the opening song on this album. You, right. do, you can play them at the same time, and it's a it's like an homage. It's a deliberate ripoff. Right, right. And uh, Shane Embry and Scott Carlson were pen pals at the time. Right. So, uh, you know, there's there's a lot of camaraderie, like, uh, across the ways through tape trading. And right. um, so this, this to me, is, is not only an, an essential grind album, but, like, just looking at that nasty cover, sure. it, it is also starting gore grind. Yeah. So so to speak. Yeah. Uh, I know that we'll talk obviously about Carcass yeah. soon, but uh, in terms of like lyrics and uh, ferocity and the intensity yeah. and still being punk and kind of uh, too punk for metalheads and, and too metal for punks, this, this album kind of does okay, it. Okay, well I know you're going to make some friends and some enemies, which for sure. is what we like to do on Lockhorns with this pick, but let's go to the board. Okay, here we go. On Repulsion, we've got Aussie Rules 777 saying, Repulsion's Horrified should be the legacy album because at the time no one was as brutal or fast as they were. They were like Slayer on Coke. So many bands have covered songs by them. Is it is it is legendary. So early contender for comment of the week, at least it would be repulsions like Slayer on Coke. Raphael Fireblades says, even if the album sounds like something you pick in the junkyard, Repulsion's Horrified is still influential in grindcore, and it's it's influenced a lot of bands like Early Carcass and Exhumed. Mm -hmm. Exhumed is another important band. Mm -hmm. Michael, that's a catchy tag. Uh, it all begins with Horrified fucking A, mm -hmm. and Luca Fallon uh, says, uh, I'll begrudgingly mm -hmm. accept Horrified, but I mean Napalm. Come on. Yeah. So... I think a lot of people would say that maybe Napalm Death Scum deserves to be the sort of uh, the legend album, but what are your thoughts on that? Well, uh, Napalm Death is. Their Scum album to me is important for similar but also very different reasons. Right. Um, it's, it's one of the very first things that came out on Eric, which is obviously a very important legendary label. Yep. Um, uh, it was also the album that caught the, the ears of John Peel, the legendary BBC DJ. Right. Um, which they went up here. Yeah, so I even brought the, uh, this is the first pressing, the original Peel sessions. Um, and so, yeah, Scum obviously is like, the most punk grind album ever. It's right. just like, it's so in your face and and uh, so amazing. What makes Scum so interesting is by the time it was released, there wasn't a single original member of Napalm right. Death. They have done a complete 360. That's a complicated family. Trip. For sure. <laughs> and Side A is like, like only has one of the same members, Mick Harris, right. who plays on Side B. They yeah. almost did like a, you know, they're two completely different sessions. And just to jump in there, I mean, maybe part of the reason why Scum gets uh, credited, celebrated mm -hmm. so much is of course Napalm Death went on to be such an important band mm -hmm. and so people tend to go back and look at well what was the first album so maybe you know Repulsion get forgotten in the sands of For time sure. a little bit compared uh, to Napalm but anyway uh, there you go Lisa do we have specific scum fans here what do you think? Scum fans. Uh, there's a lot of scum fans. There's a lot of scum fans. And Nick Adaviano says, Scum. Literally every single hallmark is there. From the short songs with brutal low vocals and blast beats with more hardcore punk styled structures. The two are absolutely synonymous with one another. From enslavement to obliteration is also a worthy contender for the list. <clears throat> but scum just flat out screams. Grindcore, mm -hmm. Bob Dole, welcome Bob Dole. Yeah. <laughs> Big scum fan, yeah, that's for sure. I knew it, Bob I knew Dole, it. Uh, I'd put From Enslavement to Obliteration as legend over scum, as it was much more well-crafted and realized form of what uh, became known as Grindcore. Mm -hmm. uh, Diz Chu says scum needs to be number one. It is just so emblematic of the grind sound and the you suffer. Well, our intro was a no homage yeah. to you suffer, of course, <laughs> is the grind uh, classic. Uh, and Thrashman says, Scum is probably the essential grindcore album. It was the first grindcore album for a start. And beyond that, it was a bold artistic statement, both in terms of the extremity and the message. Oh, and the cover is pretty great, too. Moving on, Luca Fallon is back. 
I will still argue that From Enslavement to Obliteration is the album that canonized, love that word, Grindcore. Mm -hmm. It is the grind record. It's got all of the required elements of a great grind album, blisteringly fast blast beats, distorted guitars, a heavy hardcore and crust punk influence, Lee's shredded vocals, a strong sociopolitical undertone, mm -hmm. it's important we should get into mm -hmm. that, and the introduction of Shane Embry, who is possibly the single most important single, uh, single, single uh, musician in grindcore mm -hmm. history, and Peter Day. It all started for me with uh, the Napalm Death Peel Session CD, uh, or album, if you <laughs> I played this on my college radio show, so did I. Hadn't heard anything like this before, loved the blast of noise, loved that three songs were smushed into one mm -hmm. track on the CD and were still only 30 seconds long. They took it uh, to the logical extreme from the get-go. Heard scum after this and wasn't as impressed. The Peel Sessions had an extra insanity and extra brutality. Well, <laughs> there's a mouthful. I'm dinging my own chart. <laughs> Ding it. Dinging my own chart quiet. So many comments, but yeah. we have two things that are going to help us out. Please. One, we have the guest choice. Yes. Which I think is going to help solve this argument. Yeah. And we also have a clip. Okay. From the Banger Vaults. Okay. Mm -hmm. So um, why don't we start with you, Doug, and tell us what your pick is. Yeah, so a lot of death. talk there about Napalm Death, and so give us your choice. I'm going to piss some people off. I'm excited. <laughs> Let's do this. Um, from Enslavement to Obliteration, to me, is uh, like the definitive uh, Napalm Death album. Um, I fully understand the importance of Scum, believe me. Uh, one of my favorite albums, we're, we're talking about picking our favorite kids here, right? So this yeah. is tough. But um, Shane Embry's inclusion on this. Um, Lee Dorian's um, vocalizations, I thought, uh, had a little more uh, dynamics and character than Nick Napalm. Um, Nick Napalm is like incredibly punk, I get it, for sure. Um, but this album was starting to include some of the more death metal influence, which uh, became kind of a staple in a lot of like the later grind albums that yeah. were coming out. Um, and also, if you look at the lineup on this, it's almost identical to this, the B-side of Scum minus Shane Embry's inclusion. Right. Um, same lineup that ended up doing the Peel Sessions, same lineup that ended up doing the Mentally Murdered EP. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Mick Harris uh, was refining the blast beat at, at that point. You know, yeah. obviously we'll probably talk about Pete Sandoval later mm -hmm. as somebody else who kind of pushed that blast beat a little further. Sure. But this was the album where I felt that it was clean, where you could hear everything that was going on, but still disgustingly messy. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, for me, uh, from enslavement to obliteration and, and repulsion is horrified. Those, those are my two. You'll get a lot of arguments. Luca Fallon says, yes, Doug. Sanic hey, gag <laughs> says, wow. yes. Delicious dishes. He made the right choice. Epic Games 01, I agree with Doug. Carne Verde says, <laughs> Doug is correct. Well, speaking of go. napalm death, we want to throw to a clip uh, from Shane Embry mm -hmm. uh, from my interview with him for Metal Evolution. Here we go. Why did you like playing so fast? Like it just, just, just seemed the logical thing at that point it was just like again all my life it, it, it was it seemed like a stepping stone from all the bands i got into you know right. so metallica slayer you know venom discharge and then with napalm we're like <coughs> the punk band from boston called siege who were really fast japanese hardcore band called sob they were playing fast uh, repulsion you know blast beats and it was just like how fast can we play you know and what was the transition from scum to from enslavement to obliteration for you guys was it just sort of a a continuation, more of the same, or do you guys think you 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 made a significant move forward in terms of the music? And yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think it was kind of a continuation a little bit. I, mean, I wanted to bring see my with, with Scum being quite different A and B. My a, the A side is my favorite side because that's the, that's the hardcore mix with the Celtic Frost breakdowns. So that's my so I wanted to bring more of that into the second album. Yeah. But again, it was a continuation. You know, again, Mickey wanted to play faster, and. Uh, we just went for it, really, you know. And we didn't expect the uh, second album to be bigger than the first, really, which it yeah. was, and, you know. It's cool. There we go, Mr. Shane Embry, a legend, you know, either would, we would not be here if it wasn't for uh, Mr. Shane Embry, but nice to see a clip of that. That's in the Phoenix, of course, here in Toronto. Okay, well, before we move on, I think we got to um, definitely do something here. We should get scum mm -hmm. on the board before we get uh, attacked by the grind core. <laughs> Hordes, obviously, there's a lot of love for both of these mm -hmm. napalm uh, death records. You know, people, some people liking that slightly less refined sound of mm -hmm. scum, of course, but then uh, from enslavement to obliteration, uh, uh, ever so slightly more mature yep. sound possibly on, on that record. Lisa, what do we do next? Well, if you thought it was fun to argue about Napalm Death albums, 
Let's argue about carcass elk. Let's argue about carcass. We love to argue about carcass. Okay, let's go to the board and then mm -hmm. I want to hear your opinion, Doug. Here we go. Daniel Nee says, Reek of Putrefaction, one of two albums that literally kept me up at night. The production was very messy, but it really helped develop the sound and atmosphere that is grindcore. Uh, Time Signature MMA says, I think Reek of Putrefaction belongs in the top 10, but Symphonies of Sickness is a, is a maybe bit too deathy, but hey, I was the one who mentioned the first two Bolt Throw albums, uh, so whatever. Time Signature, uh, MMA, uh, SOS is the better album, but Reek just seems more grindy and noisy and whatnot. Uh, but hey, if SOS ends up on the list, I won't complain. Nick Ottaviano says, Carcass deserve a mention for Symphonies of Sickness. I feel this record tightened up a lot of the loose ends mm -hmm. in the gr uh, Carcass grindcore sound from the first record. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. Everything is dirtier and more extreme and really helped push a lot of boundaries in underground extreme metal. Given Carcass's reputation as more of a melodic death metal band in later years, some may argue it doesn't belong. It's true. But I think there's no denying Symphony of Sickness and Recapiture of Action while we're at it are grindcore essentials. Raphael Fireblade, Carcass Symphonies of Sickness is a, gr a gore grind album, not a grind gore. Here we go. Splitting hairs there, two different <laughs> genres. Car Carcass also does not belong here because they started being influential when they turned melodic death metal with the album Heartwork. Hmm. So they, they only influence melodic death metal, and James Leckie says, Carcass. Fuck no. <laughs> Weigh in, please, Mr. Brown. Uh, for me, it's it's uh, it's reek. I don't know. Uh -huh. it, to me, it's the uh, the original cover, which you know we have here. It's yeah. it's it's one of the most vile things uh, yeah. ever. Yeah. Um, what what I like about it is is I don't think an album could sound worse than this if it tried. <laughs> uh, you know that, that might be the quote of the week. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's it's horrible. The production is incredibly lo-fi, yeah. um, but it's still punchy. It, it just sounds like a almost like a wave of noise. Yeah. Um, obviously, the the lyrics are are redundant and verbose, right. um, yeah. you know, the, the the joke goes down to they used to sit around with a medical dictionary, yeah. one of their sisters was in med school, and yeah. they, they grabbed this, like, old, like, pathology textbook, essentially, and yeah. uh, picked out the biggest words they could find, um, and, you know, in terms of shaping a sound, um, it's one of the few bands that has... Uh, has a following based on on bands that will clone a specific era. Right. So when you think of a, a band that's a carcass clone, um, I think of like the County Medical Examiners as a really really good example, or mm. our General Surgery um, Necrology is a is a fantastic EP as well. Those are two bands that only clone early carcass, mm -hmm. and I'm not talking about SOS. I'm talking about Reca Re Putrefaction. Right. Um, true archivists. True archivists <laughs> dialing it down right down to the the, the sound. Well, so. there you go. I mean, obviously a lot of different sort of opinion here but we maybe argue that putrefaction because it was so uh despite a couple comments so quintessentially uh grindcore where yes maybe we could make the argument uh symphonies of sickness was slightly mm -hmm. gravitating towards that more death metal sound with a little more sort of established riffs mm -hmm. and uh not quite the same level of chaos and absurdity mm -hmm. i think that's an important thing here i mean sort yeah. of pushing the absurd uh was a big part of what carcass was doing but anyway back to the board corgol the exterminator lovely uh voivod reference uh some symphonies of sickness was released before gore grind was a genre carcass is grind okay screaming oak symphonies of sickness is definitely more death than grind, okay, reek, grind, sure. And Oliver Grunsei says, there could really be a discussion of grindcore and gore grind are the same mm -hmm. thing as the political angle is essential in grindcore. I mean, that's kind of, an, I mean, I wouldn't say it's essential, but certainly Napalm Death had a big, big role in the kind of socio-political angle. That is, uh, I think, a divide between fans and bands. Sure. Um, you know, you think about rhythm and blues, right? Yeah. If you think about true, authentic R&B, uh, do they have to be singing about the blues in order for it to be R&B? Right, right, right. Similarly, you think about a band like Agathocles from Belgium. Yeah. Um, they coined the term mincecore as a reaction to a lot of bands um, that were singing about kind of more depraved, violent things because right. they thought that it ha grindcore had to be political right. and politically charged. Yeah. Um, you know, you know, we have Archigathus here in Canada, another band that that follows suit. You know, not saying that they would say that uh, you know Carcass is not grindcore, but that is an argument. You know. Or in fast forward a couple decades in the band, you know, that 
we've talked about in previous episodes, maybe not a center of the bullseye grindcore band, but Cattle Decapitation, mm -hmm. obviously very inspired by that more uh, political commentary uh, in the music. Yes, ma'am. There's no... Ma'am. That's all I got. <laughs> A well, very non-grindcore moment. I'll think of something. Yes, master. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it. Right. Um, we don't have a lot of consensus okay. on Carcass, yep. but we do have a lot of consensus that Gore Grind does not belong here. Okay, well here we go. Okay. Diz2 says, I think grindcore bands become a lot less interesting when they're not political. <clears throat> the rage seems a lot less precise. That's why I can't get into uh, pure gore grind. That's a good comment. Mm -hmm. I mean, same debate exists a little bit in death metal too. Mm -hmm. uh, James Leckie, uh, get your get your gore out of my grind. That's the quote like that. so far. Let's let's bookmark that. Uh, to me, grindcore is way more based in punk uh, culture. It's a good good comment. Uh, Benjamin Kosanki or Kosank says gore grind is its own genre, sacrificing speed for groove. Drums often have a tapa tapa beat uh, versus blasts all the time. Guitars are more groovy with bass emphasis. Vocals, uh, vocals are often pitch shifted. So yeah, pretty strong mm -hmm. feelings yeah. there that you know. Grindcore fans want their politics. For sure, yeah, and, and that makes sense, right? I, I think that if you are listening to something that's so extreme, you're interested in for a very specific reason. Yeah. Whether you are, uh, you know, feeling ostracized or, or you, you feel like you believe something different than everybody else. Yeah. Um, you know, that said, gore grind isn't always uh, groove oriented. Like I right. think of a band like Last Days of Humanity right. uh, as a really good example of a band that is just all on all the time. And if right. you listen to that without reading the lyrics, it sounds like. But maybe the more critical distinction here is in the is in the lyrical matter and the imagery. Yes, Dark Lord Master. <laughs> Let's just keep going with I that. Just, yeah. um, do we need to actually write gore grind off to the side? Maybe we do need yeah. to write gore grind. In case some of these bands come up, then we'll know what to do with them. I would love to write gore grind. I would love to get going because there are so <laughs> many other bands to talk about. Because right now we only have three bands. Okay, there. who's next on the chopping block? Okay. Terrorizer. Important band. We could talk about this. Thrash Maniac 99. My vote for best American grindcore album is Terrorizer World. Downfall, loved that record, love it. Uh, the production was brutally well done, thanks to more sound. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it had a little bit more of that Florida thing. And it was very heavy in sound and lyrics. R.I.P. Uh, Jesse uh, Pintado. Corgo the Exterminator agrees. Can we just get World Downfall on the board already? Anyone with a clue <laughs> knows it's the greatest grindcore record Ever. Uh, tell me about this record, Doug. Um, well, as you know, when, when, we, when we started chatting, this, this was one of my initial picks. Um, to me, what's so interesting about this is it was actually recorded after the band broke up. So they were kind of like under contract, or I'm not sure the specific circumstances, but they were going to record this. They split up. Um, Pete Sandoval started getting ready to uh, record Alters of Madness with yeah. Morbid Angel, yeah. and then they went back in the studio. Um, they ended up getting um, Vincent on bass for this album um, because their bass player was in prison at the time. Um, it is uh, sociopolitical. It is uh, you know, leftist. It is anti-religion. Um, it's a lot of the the political angle that I think that that. Grindcore st stood for when it right. first uh, originated. Right. Well, this might be an apt moment to introduce my uh, single uh, vinyl contribution to today's episode, the Grind Crusher mm -hmm. uh, compilation that came out from Earache in '89 was my gateway drug into a lot of this, and and it was Dead Shall Rise on Terrorizer that was like the uh, standout track mm -hmm. for me on that record. So. Yeah. Great band. Yeah, sure. fantastic. And it's also one of Scott Burton's uh, first, uh, I think, albums he produced mm. that was death metal or, or grindcore yeah. through more sound. Right. Interesting. Well, yeah. let's go to the board. Let's see what else people are saying about Terrorizer. Epic Games 01. World Downfall is like the main course <laughs> for grindcore. Uh, Recapitrefaction, Horrified, and From Enslavement to Obliteration, or Fido, are the sides. <laughs> and World Downfall fall is, the, is, is the meat, in my opinion. Uh, so Brokius is back. Uh, Terrorizer is the beginning of Death Grind, maybe? And Yardab Mofo says that Terrorizer is possibly the most influential grind band from America. The American reference mm -hmm. is interesting because we're largely talking about a British phenomenon so far. Mm -hmm. uh, World Downfall, particularly drum, uh, Pete's drum work, yes. which, you, which you mentioned uh, influenced almost every genre of metal. But yeah, tell me about that. I mean, this has basically been England. 
so far, but Terrorizer is, I guess, an early American concept. Yeah. Um, there was uh, a couple bands going on in, in uh, California at the time, one being Nausea and another one, I, th I think it was Majesty. Okay. Um, and Oscar Garcia, the vocalist, founded this band. Um, yeah. And they had a different drummer before Pete joined. Mm -hmm. um, they call him Pete the Feet for a reason. Um, uh, when chatting with Dave Whitty from Discordance Axis, who we'll talk about later, um, he always said that Mick Harris may have uh, invented the blast beat, but um, you know we, we have uh, th this guy in Terrorizer that came and perfected it, yeah. and and I and I like that idea of perfecting it, and and until you have seen I guess either Morbid Angel or Terrorizer live with with him on drums, it's it's unmatched. It's truly right. amazing seeing right. single footed blast beats, one one foot. It's just it's unreal. Right. Parallel yeah. that maybe for double bass is you know Ian Pace and Deep Purple. Obviously there was a Motorhead song with double bass, but Enter Dave Lombardo, and he mm -hmm. kind of turns it into a work of art. Yes. Maybe that's the parallel there. But enough about art and parallels. Lisa, what's next? Never enough about art. Oh, well, okay. <laughs> so um, it seemed that before the show started, there was a bit of a um, collusion mm -hmm. between members of the chat to agree not to talk about Bolt Thrower. Okay. But I wanted to get Doug's take on whether mm -hmm. they should be on this chart. Um, this might also be my introduction to, to Bolt Thrower, but I would say like early Bolt Thrower, mm -hmm. maybe Grind Elements, but yeah. I've always considered them a death metal band. Right. I'm not sure if, if you're the same, but... Well, I think this, this exact same conversation came up when we did the Grindcore genre, that uh, there was a lot of uh, uh, vocal uh, opinions saying that Bolt Thrower did not belong in Grindcore, because I think when we did the original chart, we put them on there. It's probably because there was just so many fucking bands already in yeah. death metal, and we were running out of room. It's mm -hmm. like, Bolt Thrower's got to be on there. They got enough grinding elements, maybe we'll get away with this, but I don't think we did in the end. Yeah. I think uh, people believe they're a death metal band. Yep, yeah, yeah, I would uh, wholeheartedly agree with that. Okay, for sure. Lisa, what is next? Something I think that Doug is going to argue about with the people on our chat who are very passionate about adding Pig Destroyer. Okay, here we go. Pig Destroyer, another important band. Let's dig into it. Grayson Hale says Pig Destroyer, Prowler in the Yard is essential. Although you could just as easily argue the case for Terrifier, but for me, Prowler in the Yard is the more unhinged and ironically terrifying of the two. Luca Hope Fallon says Prowler in the Yard by Pig Destroyer for bringing Brancor into the 2000s with such a fierce intent. Good point. We're kind of wallowing in the late 80s, early 90s here uh, for bringing Grindcore to the 2000s with such fierce intensity and also managing to pull off a Grindcore concept album mm -hmm. really well. Good point. Wyatt Wilker or Wiltshire says one thing's for sure. Pig Destroyer has to be on there. I think they've been the most important band in the scene in the last 20 years or so. Moreover, their lyrics con contrast with standard grind uh, lyrics. And what do you think about Pig Destroyer? Um, I'm actually a really big Pig Destroyer fan. Um, and you know, I think that if we're talking about what is the definitive Pig Destroyer album, is it, it is one? it is Prowler okay. in the Yard. All right. um, lyrically, I think is what makes this album so important. Um, J.R. Hayes, the lyricist on this, um, uh, brought it to kind of a, a dark level. It's a concept album, firstly, about mm. um, a man who is kind of following falling for a woman that um, he, he shouldn't and might be going in some kind of dark directions of how he's going to pursue her. Right. Um, uh, J.R. Hayes, I think, is a brilliant lyricist, uh, you know, and, you know, every single Pig Destroyer from this point on, onward, uh, mm -hmm. I thought, just got better and better in terms of lyrics. Mm -hmm. But this was the first, the, the first one on Relapse, their second full-length album. Um, the reason that I would argue that it wouldn't make the top ten, and this is, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in no slight of, of Pig Destroyer as a band, is when you think about ten albums that actually changed um, a sound at a time. Yeah. You know, around the same time as this, um, in the United States, we had, let's say, um, The Inalienable Dreamless by Discordance Axis, mm -hmm. which I, th I thought the guitar work was a little more angular and while John Chang's lyrics were brilliant on that I would say that the lyrics on Pig Destroyer is probably yard or superior to um, uh, The Inalienable Dreamless and I'm sure John Chang is watching and is pissed about that <laughs> but that's fine too um, so at the end of the day it, is it worthy of being up there I guess it depends on where your entry okay, point well, is okay well let's go back to the board and see what people yeah. are saying Becoming the Ocean says Prowler 100%. Uh, Francis Lefebvre says Prowler in the Yard, yes. Lunchbox 5930 says uh, Prowler in the Yard by Pig Destroyer made Grindcore cool again. And Dischu, Pig Destroyer has no bass guitar, so Sam won't add them. Absolutely not. Yeah. 
foreboding. <laughs> Thank you, Diz2, <laughs> on the same team. Uh, so, yeah, interesting. I mean, is it influential enough to be there? That's a good point. But I think it's worth taking stock. We're past the halfway mm -hmm. mark here. So far, we've got six records. Mm -hmm which have been presented by yourself and, and people watching that deserve to be in the top 10. Uh, but Lisa, uh, where do we go from here? So many bands. Yeah. So many bands. A lot of bands. Um, let's go with this one, and I know I'm not going to get the pronunciation right, so That's I'll okay. leave it to you guys. Yeah, it's not nasum, it's nausum. <laughs> uh, Screaming Oak says, OK, or Oki. <laughs> now we have British and American bands. Let's get some bands that move the mm -hmm. grindcore scene in other places. Good point. Nazem's uh, album Inhale, Exhale should be mentioned, or maybe uh, Helveta. Uh, Diz to Helveta by Nazem is to me their pinnacle, the height of their compositional uh, skills. Thoughts mm -hmm. on Nazem? Uh, to me, one of the most important bands for for kind of bringing that uh, Swedish guitar sound to yeah. grindcore. Right. You know, bands like Rotten Sound and Infanticide, Afgrun, Cut to fit, I could go on and on, and yeah. that uh, have emulated that sound. To me, kind of came from from Nazem, who were borrowing from, let's say, Entomb's Left Hand Path. Right. Um, I believe their that first album, Inhale, Exhale, that's the first one on Relapse, the first full length. Right. Um, and it was recorded as a two piece. Um, right. And Anders, who uh, at that point started playing drums for them, mm -hmm. had almost cycled through every single instrument in the band to, to land in so he, right. on that. And so it was him and Mieszko that covered that release. Right. Um, to, to me, that's also a pivotal change in uh, Relapse's kind of push for like this new wave of American grind. So yep. the Green So Mouse Secrets came sure. out around that sure. time. Um, just after that with Prowler in the Yard, right? right. So you have, um, I think, kind of like a... A popularity push that happened right, around that right. time it's as well. Right, the beginning of a, a, yeah. of, a, of a new wave. Is it is it inhale exhale in your opinion? I would say inhale exhale. Okay. All right. Um, Helvet, I would also argue. So I'm not sure whether we want to do both up there or um, just pick pick we'll, one we'll here. Put up inhale exhale and and just see what happens mm -hmm. out there. Okay, we got Nawsome. Okay, so so far, Lisa, we've got seven records. Yeah, and they're all old. So they're all old. <laughs> let's try and move this forward. We actually have a pick from uh, a video clip pick. Okay. Uh, we did an interview last week with uh, Tony from uh, Iron Reagan and Municipal Waste when he was in town. We asked him about his favorite gore grind, sorry, grindcore record, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, he had something a little newer he wanted to add to the tree. Okay, let's hear what uh, Tony has to say. Discord and Saxis and Alienable Dreamless is one of the best grind records of all time. Like I was listening to that record and it was like, holy fuck, it's just so heavy and fast and it was so well recorded and the CD packaging was insane at the time. It was it looked like almost like an emo record or something. It was like, what the fuck is this? And I listened to it and it like blew me away. It's still one of my favorite records of all time. Okay, so here we're we're kind of starting to modernize things here. Tony uh, weighing in on Discordance Axis, uh, that record there, the inalienable, dreamless. Uh, the board says. Uh Bernie Perez says, uh, this album is essential and important, don't forget it. What are your thoughts on this album, uh, Doug? So now we have two baseless albums side by side here, right? I quit. Um, I'm going to do the, the, <laughs> the Sharpie drop. <laughs> Um, what I particularly enjoy about this album of theirs, um, it's their last album they released. It's a, it's a three piece. Um, it is very angular guitar work. Um, John Chang's vocals were incredibly spastic and shrill. Um, I would say of all of these that we have up on, on the board so far, it is the most high pitched screeching, mm -hmm. which, um, be I wouldn't say became like a trend, but um, certainly diversified things a little bit. For sure, yeah, right? Yeah. And and I and that's what I particularly enjoyed about that yeah. release. Um, it is the best produced of the three Discordance Axis album, which, which normally I would shy away from. But uh, Dave Woody is a drummer, and uh, you know I think that anybody who is a fan of this genre would argue that these three in particular um, are were just absolute masters at their craft. John Chang also borrowed a lot from the school of Seth Putnam from Anal Cunt in terms mm -hmm. of that shrill natural nasty vocal delivery. Um, I would put this up there as one of the most important, what I would almost consider the second wave of grindcore. Okay. Um, I think they started mid-90s and they, they broke up early 2000s. Right. Um, and then, of course, Dave Whitty went on to Municipal Waste and you right. know, a million other bands, Melt sure. Banana Live. And, right. Yeah, right. Very important album. Very Incredibly cool. Important. Well, we're finally uh, getting up to date here on the board. Uh, we've got eight Mm -hmm. records now most of them again late 80s early 90s but we've got a, a, a few uh, more recent albums on there but lisa i think we're missing 
A band? Yeah, not so fast. <laughs> we skipped over something important. Brutal truth. Brutal truth. Here we go. Brutal truth. Uh, Cosmonen says, brutal truth, extreme condo conditions, damp. I don't know what this is saying. Demand extreme. Demand extreme responses is so important. Thank you. Uh, Sanic Hey Hag uh, says, brutal truth should be on the list in full caps. And time, time signature MMA, extreme conditions, I think, introduced many thrash fans to grindcore because of Lilker's background in nuclear assault. Interesting. So mm -hmm. it may be important in expanding the grindcore fan base. That's a good point. And the Nightmare Rider says, we need brutal truth sounds from an animal kingdom <laughs> on this list. Short, uh, sharp songs with ultra high intensity and uh, distort uh, and distortion. It fits uh, the, the name. Well, here we go. We do have a, a magnet for uh, extreme conditions, dot, 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 uh, mm -hmm. brutal truth. Thoughts on this record? Uh, this album is essential for anybody's collection. Cool. Um, I remember the hype sticker that came with the record um, was, you know, Danny Lilker's new band. Obviously, he was in Nuclear Assault and Anthrax before that, mm -hmm. the founding bass player for Anthrax. Mm -hmm. And um, it, to me, this had the gristle that Repulsion's Horrified had. Mm -hmm. um, some people, especially in this album, might consider this to be leading the direction of death metal. I thought that yep. Kevin Sharp's vocals were very death metal, right. whereas Need Control, Need to Control rather, was more of a, a straightforward grind album. But you know, this is one of those, just like Scum, it started it all. Um, and uh, you know, you, you think about the original drummer, Brutal Truth, who there's this phrase called the hyper blast, yeah. um, which he did on this. And um, you know, uh, drummers like Brian Fajardo from like Noisier and Gridlink and, and PLF, you know, credit him as a, a very important drummer. So mm -hmm. as in terms of influence, Brutal Truth, Extreme Conditions, 100%. Cool. Yeah, yeah. So I think you start to hear uh, in, in bands like Cryptopsy as well, this sort of that hyper blast mm -hmm. thing and that kind of, obviously Cryptopsy being much more a death metal band, but I can mm -hmm. understand why people making the argument that Brutal Truth had a little bit more of a death metal uh, uh, aspect to their sound. Lisa, we're actually into, we got nine records up here and we're, we're turning the corner towards the end of the show here. What's mm -hmm. what's going to happen? But there's a lot of things left over. A lot of um, a lot of like really good comments, but only a few. Right. From one person or another. But right. I feel that um, we need to address nails. Scattered leftovers. It's like the Carcass album that never got made. Nails. <laughs> Luca Fallon, I think the only album from the last 10 years that deserves a spot is Unsilent Death for keeping grindcore alive and well in the modern day and adding sludgy power violence elements to a sound that still rips in a way grindcore has going back to napalm. Truly the flag carriers for modern grind. The most important thing to happen to grindcore probably since Helvetta. These are big, big words. Uh, Rickstar1123 uh, says that uh, nails should not be on there. Nails, uh, along with bands like Weekend Nachos, not a grindcore name, fall <laughs> under the power violence genre. Do not put up there. Tell me about Nails. Uh... So Nails have released three albums. Yeah. Um, I think that their their last one, I think it's what is it called? Uh, you, you will not be one of us. Yes. Uh, caused a lot of controversy. Just I think that some people thought it had like an attitude that was not present in, in the hardcore scene. Right. Right. Um, I personally would argue that Nails not a grindcore band. Hmm. I think it's a, a really fast hardcore band. Right. Um, no offense to the band, uh, they're all really good dudes. And yep. uh, and actually their touring guitar player, Leon, is in um, a kind of reformation of Terrorizer that's out there right, right. now as well. Right. So right. obviously some wonderful players that are playing with them, but um, I would put Nails under either power violence or just really right. fast extreme. Well, let's get uh, some names up on the board just so we yeah, got, for sure. uh, we talked about Bolt Thrower. Uh, a while ago, uh, is it two T's or one? Help me out here. Is it two? It's two words, right? Yeah, Bolt two thrower. words. Um, Bolt thrower and uh, nails. Um, just so we at least have them up the board. Uh, because obviously people are bringing them up. Yeah, same uh, with like the Locust. I'm not sure if you're familiar with them. That's no. another band that that some people might put in uh, the the grind category, where it's where it's just experimental enough, or it's it's pulling away from the core of grindcore. Yeah. No pun intended. Um, but yeah, it just it just misses the mark. Well, I, I actually like that that latest Nails record. I thought it was pretty fucking yeah. ballsy. Whether it's a grindcore record mm -hmm. is for you guys to debate. Let's go back to the board. Local Scarasio. I handled that well, eh? There will be one. Uh, there will never be. You will never be one of us. From Nails must be uh, there. Uh, becoming the ocean. Nails shouldn't. 
be there. Uh, Ivaldas uh, Bumeka, uh, Nails is Power Violence. M-A-D-A, -A, Nails, maybe too punk and not enough metal. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, pretty divided. Yeah. I think safe to say that there's not enough consensus on Nails to add them to the canon mm -hmm. of Grindcore. Lisa, are we gonna get a 10th band in here, our 10th record? Uh, there's a couple people um, picking up on your comment about The Locust. Okay, Cassidy Robinson, I like <laughs> The Locust and this album is great, but I think they're too experimental of a band to totally qualify as Grindcore. Their backgrounds are in Hardcore and Screamo. They include a lot of farty sounding electronic samples and keyboards and some tracks include breakdowns and halftime moments. To me, The Locust are grind influenced for sure, but ultimately they're just their own sound. Maybe mm -hmm. too soon to tell. For sure. Who knows? Uh, often, as we like to say, I mean, really, part of the reason why a lot of these albums are so old is because I think to deserve to be on the essential albums list, you need to have demonstrated some kind of influence. Mm -hmm. That's the key word here. Yeah. So speaking of influence, there's a, there are a few bands that come to mind, right. and, I'm, and I'm and both of these bands I'm going to bring up are not again 100% 100% grindcore. Um, one being, and I'm going to swear a lot now. One being anal cunts, and the other one being fuck the facts. Right. Um, and uh, fuck the facts, obviously, proud Canadian sure. here. Um, female fronted band. Yep. Um, but what I particularly enjoy about them is it's never been part of their shtick. You know, yep. you, you, you'll often like I get really uh, offended and upset when like a promoter will promote a band as female fronted as right. almost as if like their femininity is like dangled in front of right. you like this is why you should come check them out whereas their, their singer Mel I think is uh, one of the most like vicious uh, deliverers of, of music yeah, live. Absolutely. Um, they are a force to be reckoned with. They are incredibly tight. Yeah. They bring up enough um, angular stuff. If you think about their early, like Die Miserable, some of their early relapse albums, mm -hmm. I think are uh, very, very important. Um, where it's, it's still grindcore, but experimental enough. Mm -hmm. um, so that'll be a band that I'll put forward. I'm not sure what the audience. Okay, uh, well, let's get them up here yeah. at least. We have Fuck the Facts, and then you mentioned Anal Count as well. I did. Um, and, um, you know, obviously, they there is uh, an ethical debate that goes hand in hand with, with anal cunt. Um, uh, lyrically, incredibly offensive. Yeah. Um, I, I think they were trolls before the internet existed. Right. Um, you know, you, you went to go see them, you had to be prepared for absolutely anything. Yeah. But to me, Morbid Florist uh -huh. as, as an EP, um, you know, Seth Putnam's screams and uh, Tim Morse's uh, drum delivery, I think is just so, so intense. Right. And I know it was recorded in just a few hours. To me, that is one of the most extreme noise core releases of all time and needs some credit. Well, Done partly deal. what we're dealing with here too, uh, pardon the digression, but compared to say death metal or black metal, the other two sort of original extreme metal genres, grindcore arguably a little smaller, a little mm -hmm. more scattered, if mm -hmm. you will. And really, you know, yes, there was an American scene and, and of course a UK scene, mm -hmm. but uh, correct me if I'm wrong, obviously there's bands from other parts of the world, Nazem and Japan and others, mm -hmm. but uh, there weren't those sort of huge scenes. Uh, you mentioned Flint, of course, but uh, maybe not the same as say a Bay Area or a Stockholm mm -hmm. uh, or, 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 um, <clears throat> or others. But let's see what the board is saying. I think we're seeing some new, Bands up here, Lisa? Yeah, so there's a, you know, people talking about Siege, people talking about Rotten Sound, but the one band that is sort of rising to the top for the last spot yeah. is Agoraphobic Nosebleed. Yeah, I, I'm not surprised to see them up, mm -hmm. and I'm surprised it took uh, 50 minutes yeah. for them to appear. Yeah. Matthew Levin's uh, agoraphobic, uh, agoraphobic Nosebleed, Altered States of America, completely deranged. Good characteristic for a grindcore album. This album boxes you around the ears, spits in your coffee, and then dumps in your toilet and doesn't flush. <laughs> oh. quote, quote of the week, uh, because it's very grindcore in spirit. Yeah. Raphael Fireblade, uh, Agor Agoraphobic Nosebleed album, um, Honky Reduction, <clears throat> was influential in the late 90s in grindcore and one of the biggest records in, in Relapse uh, Records history. Andre uh, Gajardoni says uh, Agoraphobic Nosebleeds altered states of America insanely fast political, brutal, groundbreaking with speed. This is some strong comments coming in. Mm -hmm. Rockstar1123, uh, one, one, agoraphobic nosebleed. Anyone? I don't know if we want drum machine grindcore up here, uh -huh. but Altered States of America has 100 songs in under 22 minutes. Grindcore to the max. Mm -hmm. What do you think? 
Yes, yeah. you know, agoraphobic nosebleed are, are important for a lot of reasons. Um, so you, you, you look at Scott Hall from uh, mm -hmm. both Pig Destroyer and Agoraphobic Nosebleed. Pig Destroyer was actually his, his side project that he started. So, you know, a bit of background, the band was called Agoraphobic Nosebleed because they would never perform live. So it was the right. idea that they were just going to kind of stay in their basement and release right. uh, drum machine uh, influenced grind, uh, which allowed them to push the speed to like, like ungodly bar barriers. Yeah. Um, I look at like Jack Japanese bands like Gorbion Necropsy is another early uh, drum machine grind band and mm. uh, you know Agoraphobic kind of put them into the, the public eye um, so to speak. Um, having a chance to see them um, pull that off live, you know I filmed their very first show ever um, and then pull that off just like to a T. I, I, I honestly think that Scott's an absolute genius on guitar right. and, um, and, and lyrically they're in incredibly dark and offensive, mm -hmm. and, um, but delivered by three very different vo vocalists. Right. So um, we have uh, Jay, who handles the noise, but writes a lot of their lyrics. We have Richard Johnson from Enemy Soil um, and Drugs of Faith, two amazing American grind bands. And we also have Cat Cats, um, and she kind of rounds out the sound with just kind of like a, a, a different, more like shrill again, high pitched scream to it. And I think that definitely Ultra States of America, Get that on there. there Doug go. Brown got cowbell. It wasn't me for a change. Ah. How refreshing. Doug Bell. Uh, Doug, Doug Bell. <laughs> Doug Bell. Doug Brown needs his own show. Yeah. Yeah. Can, sorry. Uh, sorry. We could obviously talk about this. Uh, <laughs> this would be like the longest uh, grind. That's good, but I mm -hmm. think it's fair to say that the agoric for uh, agoraphobic nosebleed. Uh, uh, we'll just say altered for short. Mm -hmm. Seems to be the elusive uh, tenth album uh, that we've been waiting for, and really, time is running short. If you disagree, it's pretty much out. Got to get the comment in. The multi-vocal approach that you mentioned, mm -hmm. also a key grindcore um, element. We heard it way back here. That idea that you mm -hmm. could actually have two guys screaming at you at once. Uh, was not, I mean, I don't know the full lineage there, but in extreme, extreme metal, I think this may have been the beginning of that. I don't know if you know. I'm not sure the exact origins right. of it, but I, I know that um, having people with two different registers yeah, of singing right. um, allow for, you know, a, a different level of ferocity and, uh, you know, A and B in particular, having three vocalists with yeah. like completely different ways of delivering things yeah. and inter it's like the Beastie Boys, yeah, right? Yeah. You know? But that's cool. I mean, we never really mentioned that. That's yeah. sort of just another element of this set of grindcore that's just layering on the brutality and messiness of the production. Yes, Lisa. I didn't even have to do anything. <laughs> I just it's see like... that mallet come up and it's like crushing my soul. <laughs> it's not really that crushing. Anyway. But I'm glad it is in your own brain. It, it, it so is. there's like a last minute, like Flurry. just that yeah. uh, last past the finish night line on Asuk Misery. Asuk Misery. Help me out here. Uh, so that's probably short for Misery Index, yes. which was yes. their second release. Right. Um, a band that I know very well, and, yep. and I'm actually gonna, if we're gonna, if we're gonna put anything on there, I would put their one of their early EPs on, Necro okay. Salvation. Okay. Um, they are, uh, again, the argument is they're too death metal-y, right? Yep. So they're another right. band that recorded yeah. it in Morris Sound, but a Necro Salvation in particular, and when they had their original vocalist Paul in the band, um, and he also uh, sang on their first album, I think that that is, uh, you know, something definitely worthy yeah. of, you know, again, that change in, in the mid-90s in the United States. Um, even bands like Phobia, Means of Existence is another critical album where, right. you know, it was taking the British sound, something that was mm -hmm. primarily British, mm -hmm. and making it a little more, like, riff-oriented, whereas the, the noise was very strong in, in Carcass and uh, Napalm Death, but you know. I think it's going to take a lot to topple these guys because I don't think one comment constitutes a chorus. Uh, well, a there, were, there, there were quite a few. I could I actually couldn't get to just them got short there were so many, yeah. but. Are we 100% sure about Pig Destroyer? Because maybe we could flip those. Yeah, so I, I would crazy? I would even put... What would you do, Doug Brown? Oh, well, and again, this isn't all about me, but let's make it about Mostly. me. Mostly. Mostly. Um, I, I would probably put... Oh, jeez. I would put Phobia's Means of Existence. I would put Necro Salvation by Asak. Or, I'm going Canadiana here again, I would put Dahmer's Dahmerized. Uh -huh. And Dahmer is a band from Quebec City that um, went on to, you know, members went on to do Mezrine and uh, Fistfuck. Again, apologize about some of these awful, <laughs> awful words for anyone tuning in here. Um, but Dahmerized was... Uh, was so, so aggressive. It, it reminded me, there's a band from Spain called Danak, again, with that vocal delivery that was like every single uh, consonant was its own, uh, 
was its own like emphasis and hit. Right. Um, there was like almost no slow parts. I gotta cut you off though. Are we getting caught in the weeds here? We need to think about the 10 most influential grindcore albums of all time. Stakes are high. Mm -hmm. What is that? What is that record? Is the one that's missing? I put it to the chat okay. and everyone was all excited and then basically people said Pig Destroyer has to stay. Okay. 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 Right. Well, and if we're talking about Have Magnet will stay. <laughs> with influence on the most amount of people, I'm bringing up bands that were never on major labels. Of course. Right? Yeah. And we're, that's fine. I mean, yeah. we're all here because we love the music that we love, yeah. not because of its popularity, but I do think that we do need to stay focused on that critical uh, distinction of being influential in order to be uh, part of mm -hmm. the uh, the top 10. Lisa, I think we may have made it. I think, I think, well, we have to stop. We have to stop. We've gone on way too long for a grindcore show. Exactly. <laughs> we exactly. can't have this be the longest show in Lockhorns. I preferred the way we started. That was good. <laughs> yeah. um, but we done it? Uh, yeah, I mean, the last thing to talk about is the future. Right. And I know you could probably name drop like a hundred cool current bands, but I think it's more about how this connects to what's happening now. What are the other sub sub genres that we should be tackling mm -hmm. on the show? Stuff like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Tell us what you think. Future. Um, Future of, of, of Grindcore. Well, I, I hope and I feel as if Grindcore is going back to its DIY roots. Right. Going back to kind of like that grimy lo-fi aesthetic. I think about a lot of the men's core that's coming from the Midwest. Um, you know, bands like Pizza High Five and Violent Gorge. Um, just just some very important kind of like grimy lo-fi. Again, bring up the gristly bass tone of Repulsion's Horrified. Um, stuff like that. I think that Blackened Grind mm -hmm. and uh, kind of bringing up kind of a... Uh, kind of like a dark, like almost evil sound to it. Think bands like Coffin Birth um, <laughs> from uh, Australia come to mind. Um, yeah, there's there's so many bands to mention, but uh, you know, I, I think that going back to the DIY roots of this, just like pulverizing. Right. I'm gonna give a shout out to a band called Fiend from right. Fresno, California. Right. Two piece sounds a lot like Warsaw from Australia. For any of I'm mentioning Australia a lot, very very important country for grindcore. Yeah. Um, but again, the DIY aesthetics, raw, gritty, nasty, gross. I don't know. Is that why we like music? There I, you go. That's why I like it. If you like Grindcore, you gotta watch Doug Brown's uh, documentary coming soon. Okay, well there we have it folks. We got our top 10 albums. Obviously we got Carcass, we got a couple albums from Napalm Death, Repulsion, Brutal Truth, Nazem was a relatively late edition, of course, Terrorizer, Pig Destroyer, mm -hmm. some debate uh, there, Discordance Axis, again another uh, American band bringing us uh, closer to the present day, and A and B uh, Altered uh, States of America was the last one. Yes. And we had our comment of the week from Matthew Levins or Levins. There you go, Matthew. You got the you got <laughs> yeah. the crown this this uh, this week. He says A and B's uh, Altered States of America completely deranged. This album boxes you around the ears, spits in your coffee, then dumps in your toilet and doesn't flush. Might be straight out of Bill, Bill Steer uh, a lyric sheet there. Right there. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you very Fantastic. much for having me on. Check out uh, Slave to the Grind coming soon. Thank you, Lisa, Daniel, um, Andrew, and. Craig for making it happen. Next week, uh, we're continuing updating our, our, our family tree of metal genre by genre, and we're tackling alternative, which undoubtedly will get people frothing at the mouth. And joining me for that will be Wade uh, McNeil, who's been with us before from, of course, uh, the band Alexis on Fire, and uh, who is also on 102.1 The Edge. There you go. We did it. Top 10 grindcore albums of all time. Thanks for joining us. See you next week on Lockhorns.